Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> we just all greet him, so like, praise the Lord. Welcome tonight. We welcome our friends Tim and Jovita. They're part of our family. Some of you don't know them, but they are a blessing. They've been up in Ohio, and now they've come back. So we're glad they're here, and all of you are here tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise God. Uh, as we said Sunday, we do have a 30% off sale going on in the bookstore. So if you want to buy some music CDs, faith books, go back there and take advantage of that 30% off sale, okay? Well, sweet talk the bookstore worker. Maybe that'll give you part of your money back. And uh, our men that are single, the single men, yeah. Pastor David said, I'm going to crash that party, right? They're having spaghetti dinner September the 26th. My husband said, well, that's okay. Us married men will have a steak dinner. <laughs> yeah. So the single men, Brother Ed Gomaka, put your head up and put your hand up. Amen. <laughs> He's overseeing that September 26th at his uh, clubhouse place, and we have another announcement on the board back there with the uh, address, but you can see him too. Some handouts. And some handouts, good. And then we have Bible school beginning September 30th. Wednesday, September 30th, so keep marking that on your calendar, and that's, this will be the second year, first term, Pastor Steve's teaching on spirit, say spiritology. Spiritology. We're going to be learning about in the Bible, about angels, demons, man on three dimensions, and believer's authority, and I'm sure there will be other good stuff going on. Praise the Lord. Pastor David. Amen. Preach it, Pastor David. Okay. Now we know God is a God of abundance, right? He doesn't lack for any good thing. We shouldn't lack for any good thing, Amen. right? Amen. If anybody should be blessed, we should be blessed. Amen. I'm prejudiced. Yes, if I'm a child of God, we should have more. You know, that's just God's promise. That's the way God is. Um, I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures on abundance. First one is on abundance of joy. This is in Psalms 36, 8. Thou shalt be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of pleasures. Wow, that's pretty good. That's, that's good. Then we have abundant life. Of course, everyone knows this one, and I like this one because it tells you the difference between God and the devil. This is John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not but to kill, steal, and destroy, but I come that thou might have life and life more abundantly. That's our God. That's not that's Satan's the other part. We're the good part. Then he gives you abundant grace. One grace. This is in 2 Corinthians 9 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, all things, be abound to every good work. Yeah. All our works should be good work. Yeah. Then we have abundant power. And this is Ephesians 3 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Amen. He can do things we can't even imagine. Yeah. He's so graceful. He is so, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of the word, but there's just too much God. He'll outdo anything you ever think of. I'm telling you. You think like this, it's like, you know, that's God. I'm trying to get myself in that place because sometimes, you know, you think like that. I have to think bigger. Yeah. Then he's also our abundant supply. This is Ephesians 4.19. But my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. His, not ours, his. Yeah. And whatever he has, we have. Because we have a covenant with him, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he wants you to put in remembrance of his word. Yeah. And me and him have a lot of conversations. So I'm telling you right now. <laughs> And, you know, the other difference, too, between before I was saved and I wasn't saved, and I've said this a zillion times, once you're saved, you know he heard your prayers. Yeah. Okay? 
And I used to not be saved. I used to have the shotgun prayer. I prayed a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and hope something got there. But now I know he hears my prayers. The first time, you know, he's not, did I miss it? No, he heard it the first time. Okay, and then the last one is abundant entrance. In 2 Peter 1, 11, for, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to have one heck of an entrance and that day comes. Yeah. Do you know when you go to be with the Lord, he sends angels with, with you to go there. You don't go by yourself. He sends his people down there to take his children with him. Amen. You're never alone, Amen. ever, on earth or when you leave. I think that's profound that most people never think about that either. You'll never be alone. He doesn't think that way. Does everyone have an offering room? All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that you are an abundant God. We just thank you, Father. We are hooking in with you, Father. And the first thing to do that is by tithing. So you put a protection over our monies, Father. And we just thank you for blessing those who gave today, Lord. Sixty, forty, a hundredfold. According to they, and they believe, Lord. It's up to us what we believe for. And we just thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Ready to receive from Pastor Gail? She's a walking Bible. Amen. <laughs> and full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Thank you. Praise God. Pastors are uh, having family time and they asked me to minister tonight and next Thursday night. So, you're in for me. <laughs> in the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's, let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word. We thank you, Father, for enlightening our eyes and our ears of the Spirit, Father, to receive from you tonight. We bind all hindrances, and we plead the blood over us right now, spirit, soul, and body, and we just command us to be good, uh, good ground, Father, to receive your word and to, to grow it and to prosper and to, to make it into what your word says we can be. And we thank you, Father, for that. And we praise your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, I'm going to be talking about minding the spirit. And that's a little bit of a play on word, and you'll get it as I talk about minding the spirit. Okay? Uh, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to go to 3 John 2, but before I go there, I want to read Ephesians 2.8. It says, for it is by free grace, and what is grace thought the merit of favor, that you are saved, which is delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. This is the Amplified. Amen. Through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. For we are God's workmanship, that's verse 10. Uh, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. Recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works, which God, this is a clincher here, predestined, in other words, he planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. It's another key word, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. So not only did he plan our life out there for us, or the path that we should take, not that we do take it, obviously this is a joy, right? Yeah. But he says that he's made a path for us, he's cut it out beforehand. He's planned and predestinated something for us to do and to walk in. And actually, every one of us should be walking in the same path. It's not like a path of what you're going to be or what your calling is. It's just a path of being blessed and prosperous in every area of our life. Okay? And he wants us to live the good life. He has already made arrangements for us to prosper and be blessed, spirit, soul, and body. And then that gets us to verse uh, 2 of John, 3 John. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things, above all things, that you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Okay, now what is our soul? Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Okay, it's our thought life, too, if you want to think about it. Whatever comes into your ears is going into your mind. And then whatever stays in your mind is eventually going to go into your what? Your spirit, the heart of you, the part of you that either produces life or death, right? Okay, and we know that the Lord said that I've given you life and death. Choose you this day, you know, remember he said that? He said, life and death is in the power of his tongue. And they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. So we have the choice of taking life with our words or speaking death over it with our words. Amen. So the whole key here is that if our mind isn't prospering, okay, and if our mind isn't uh, renewed to the word of God, then our spirit is not able to receive from God. You get it? So it's not just reading the word and dropping into your spirit, that'd be great. But it's got to go through this first. And that's why the Lord says, you know, that's the part of us that's not born again. The only part of that's born again is our spirit man, okay? Our body isn't, okay? And neither is our mind. But the Bible says that our body's going to do whatever we tell it to do. The body's easy. It's kind of like a dog on a collar and a chain. 
you drag that little dog with the collar and chain and that dog's gonna follow where you're going, okay? And that's how your body is. Your body's like that little dog on the chain. And your spirit should be the one dragging that dog. But sometimes it's your mind that's not renewed to the word of God that drags your body. And your spirit can't do anything about it because it's not in a position where it can actually take authority. And like, I guess the one thing that I like to say that kind of really makes sense is whatever you feed is going to what? Grow. And whatever you starve is going to die. Okay. So if we feed our spirit man the word of God every day, okay, and renew our mind, then we are going to grow up spiritually, right? Amen. But if we feed it garbage in, what's going to happen? garbage out and we're not going to know how to equip ourselves when things come against us obviously let me put it this way even when you're in the word you know we all know that when we're in the word and we have things attack us it's a fight of faith when we're in the word to get that garbage out of us can you imagine not feeding yourself the word of god even how much harder it is you know for you to receive what god has for us so we've got to we've got to renew our mind to the word it says, we are not to be moved by anything but the word of God. Nothing else should move us. Amen. You know, nothing. Amen. You know, that's what we need to attain to. We've got to know what belongs to us, and we've got to possess it with our faith. Right? Amen. Okay, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we want to please God, we've got to be operating faith. Um, I like this little illustration. Uh, Copeland said that years ago, um, the Lord appeared to him in a vision and he offered him a cookie and he says he says i haven't eaten cookies in a long time <laughs> he says because i've just trained myself i don't want to have that stuff in me but he says when god offers you a cookie you're going to take it usually <laughs> but he said he didn't take it right away because he was kind of surprised why is god offering me a cookie he had platter of cookies and and jesus said to him in not a not so happy voice he says take a cookie so he knew Jesus wasn't too happy. So he took the cookie, okay? And then Jesus said to him, he said, if anyone asks you if you would like a cookie, you tell them, no, I have a cookie. Now, I'm gonna explain that. When you're believing for your healing or whatever it is you're believing, well, let's take healing for instance, okay? And God has already provided that for you. By his stripes, you were healed. Okay. So we're going to say healing is the cookie. God has already provided it. And he gets upset when we don't take what he's already provided for us. You know, this is my people are destroyed, Hosea 4, 6, for lack of knowledge. He says, God doesn't like his people dying. He doesn't like his people uh, living under the circumstances. He doesn't like us being deprived of what he paid so dear a price for. So basically he's saying, okay, if you already have it, the devil's going to come to you and say, don't you want to be healed? And what you're supposed to say to them is, no, I already am healed. I already have the cookie. See what I'm saying? I'm going to put in that kind of a thing. In other words, God's giving you all the cookies spiritually that you could ever want or need in this life. Okay? And he's given it to you, and you should have taken it gladly. And then when the devil tries to make you think you don't really have what you're believing for, you, and he says, oh, don't you want to get better? Don't you, oh, man, it doesn't look like it's working. You're supposed to say to them, hey, devil, I already got it. Leave me alone. It's mine. You know? So, so we've got to be so convinced of what God has provided for us in the spiritual sense that we can take it with our faith and have it manifest in the physical sense you see what i'm saying so our mind has to be renewed yes what god says he means and what he means will happen right so that's what we've got to believe we've got to believe that so copeland said okay so he said i did it he said and then i took it let's go to mark 23 and just look at the an uh, analogy that he had there which i thought was interesting and we all could recite this verse <laughs> This is one of the number one verses that 
If we haven't memorized it on purpose, we know it already because we have read it so many times and heard it so many times. Mark 11, 23, it says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Heart, okay, that's your inner man. But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Amen. Okay, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And when you stand praying, give, if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So he said, basically, the whole key that Jesus taught him, it says, first you say, I believe it. Okay, I believe what you've done. Okay? Then you're supposed to say, I will. In other words, I will to take what he's given me. Okay? And then it's because it said, you'll have whatever you say. And then he says, you're supposed to say, I have it. Even if you don't see it or feel it. Because since when does your body rule you? Okay? Our body is not supposed to be ruling us. In other words, if our body says, I hurt, what do we say? In Jesus' name, I command that pain to go now in Jesus' name. But we, we're supposed to speak to our bodies. Because if we don't speak to our bodies, our body's going to speak louder to us. You know what I mean? It's going to talk to us. So we need to talk to it to shut it up. You see what I'm saying? And the only way we can shut up pain is with the word of God. Believe me. I know. Okay? <laughs> okay, then after it says, I have it, we say, I thank you. We thank God for it before we actually see it. Why? Because if you're thanking somebody for some, something, that's basically saying, I've already got it. Thank you for it. Right? So if somebody hands you a gift, you take the gift. Oh, I have it. You know? Thank you. You got it, right? So basically, you're letting your faith speak and saying, Lord, I am thanking you because I know you've already given it and done it for me. And I have it by faith. Okay? So I'm thanking you. And the last thing he says is I forgive. Now remember when Jesus said that, uh, he says, which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or rise up and take thy bed and walk. Remember that? Remember how he always says, which is easier to say that? And he says, but so you may know, you know that I am the son of God. He said, rise and take up thy bed and walk. He'd already forgiven the man. He already said, thy sins are forgiven. And I always, you know, I always knew that was a good thing to walk in forgiveness, but it made it kind of make sense more to me than ever that the reason why he tells us that, it's not that he's trying to be saying that if you don't forgive, you're not going to get anything. Basically what he's saying is when you're not in forgiveness, you're not in God's, uh, how do we say it? It's kind of like a, a water um, faucet. And if you turn the water on and you put a cup underneath there, it's going to fill that cup up. But if you take that cup a little bit, move it out of the way just a little bit, what's going to happen when that blessing comes down, that water comes down? It's going to miss the cup. So basically, you're, that's it. You're not positioning yourself for healing or whatever God has for you because you're out of sync. And that's why he says forgiveness, you know, walk in forgiveness and all that. So I thought, well, that was an interesting way to put it. It's, it's not that he's trying to be hard on us, because I'm telling you, sometimes it's hard to forgive when, when, when the enemy does things to you, right? You kind of err, you know? But we got to do it by faith. Because the reason he's telling us to do that is because when we're not in faith and we're in, not in unforgiveness, we are not in a position for God to have his blessings come to us, no matter what it is. Amen. You know? It, it's, he's saying that for our sake. That's why he told the man, which is easier? He said, I forgive you. He says, your sins are forgiven you, he told the man. And he, then he says, walk, okay? So I just thought that was really, that's what I learned this week. I thought that was really good, Amen. you know? And, and that we need to say this. We need to speak this over us, that we have what God has for us, yeah. no matter what we see with this physical eyeball. Amen. You see what I mean? We have to, because if we don't, we're going to be body ruled and sense ruled. And, and the Bible says, let no man think he's going to receive anything from God. He's going to be like a man unstable and wavering in his position, James says, like a boat rocking boat back and forth, you know, because they don't really know, did God really do this for me or did he not? 
Because if he did, wouldn't I be okay already? No, not in the physical maybe, but yes, as God says you are. You know, it's kind of like having the cart before the horse. You see what I'm saying? You know, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Well, then you will never see it. Because we have to believe it by faith before we are ever going to see it in the natural. You know, and, and that's that's what the word says. You know, God is trying to keep stuff away from us. He's trying to get it to us. He doesn't want anybody to, to die young. He doesn't want us to, to live underneath our privileges. He doesn't want us to be in lack. He doesn't want us to be in need of any kind. You know, God wants us fulfilled in every area of our life. Okay? So we're not supposed to ask for body anything. We're not supposed to say, body, do you feel healed? Because your body's going to say, ow! No! I don't feel healed. I mean, goodness. I don't dare ask my body that ever. Ever. You know, no. And you know why? Because the devil's a sense devil. Yes. You know, if you want to live in the supernatural, you've got to walk in the spirit because he's a flesh devil. Yes. Did you ever notice that? Yes. He operates in the flesh. Yes. He talks to you, to your ears. He talks to your mind. He does things to get you to react because he's a flesh devil. So if you don't react, he's going to think, huh, what, didn't they hear what I said? You really get him torqued and ignore him. You know, when somebody's trying to bully someone, especially kids in school, the worst thing that you could ever do to that bully is act like you didn't see him. When you see people acting like a nut, like hanging out of their cars and acting like jerks out on the highway, you ever seen them when you're driving by and doing that? And they're saying all sorts of things trying to get your attention, especially if they do it to some, some women a lot of times. Okay, now if that woman kind of looks around and goes, oh, I feel like I didn't even see it. Oh my goodness, that's, that just really burns them. Well, what do you think it does to the devil? If we ignore him, he gets offended. And if anybody should be offended, he should be, right? Okay, so our spirit won't be stronger than our body unless we feed it every day with God's words. We've got to be in the word. I like what, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, but if I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So what is he doing? He's keeping it in subjection. What does that mean? He's keeping his body and mind in subjection to his spiritual man. He's keeping it under. It's kind of like putting reins on a horse. You know, whoa, don't go there and pull it on it, you know? It may hurt that horse for a second, but that horse is going to pay attention. Okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. It hurts, you know, when he pulls on my rein. I'm stopping. Okay? So we need a rein in that body, and the body may go, ouch, I don't like you doing this to me. But it's going to be so much happier in the end, you know, because God's going to have his way with us, right? So we got to think about that. We gotta rein it in, rein it in, you know. So we need to receive everything God has for us. And forgiveness is a doorway of healing, only because if you don't forgive, you cut yourself off to what He has for you through the Word. Okay. So we have to know the way to have faith, and faith makes a way. Yeah. So we have to know the way, who is Jesus, right? Yeah. To have faith, yeah. let's have faith in God, the God kind of faith, and that faith in God will make a way. Amen. And he said he's already made the way for us, right? He's prepared a path for us to walk in it that we should prosper and be in the abundance, right, of his life. So he's already made that predetermined thing for us. And what is it saying, John 8, 32? John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, right? Yes. And the truth shall make you free. So what is the truth? The truth is the word of God, right? Whatever is in here is the truth of the Word of God, okay? So, but we've got to know it. You know, you can't just like, you know, think it. You can't, even just reading it and just speaking it out of your mouth once or twice, if you don't have any faith in it, isn't going to help you much. It's only until you meditate on it and, and realize, okay, that is for me. That's mine. I have a right to that. And then get mad at the one who's trying to keep it from us, the devil. And so get mad at God thinking he's the one keeping it from us, which he's not. It's the devil. And that's why we've got to rein in our mind. We've got to get our mind reined in to his spirit to know that God isn't keeping any good thing from us. We've got to know it because our body is the house of our spirit, right? 
Now, the reason we want our spirit man uh, to be in charge, right? And we want our bodies to be well. We want our bodies to be in health and to prosper and to be controlled. Okay, think about it. Would you want to put a nice new car, consider that being our spirit man, and when we're born again, into a dilapidated garage that's falling apart? Well, a body that's that's dilapidated and falling apart is basically a body that's not being led by the spirit that's leading the mind, will, and emotions, and the spirit do whatever it wants to do. You know, like like that worldly term that says, it feels good, do it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not the word of God. You know, we're not to be body ruled, we're supposed to be spirit ruled. And actually, eventually, mind ruled, because if our mind is renewed to the word of God, then it's going to rule what comes in and out of it and say, eject, when the devil says something in there, eject, we don't want this, goodbye, garbage, you know, we don't take that, you know, sewer water, no way, you know, and then just release what God has for when it's a good thing, is it an honest, virtuous, just, good report thing, then we'll meditate on it, but if it's not, out, you know, we're not keeping that garbage. Because if we keep it in, it's going to fester and it's going to it's going to affect us. You know, it's the little foxes. That scripture says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little tiny things that get us. You know, sometimes we're we're a master over the big things, and then something little happens and we blow up. You know, we're all like that. We're human. You know, but the devil knows that, so he's trying to get in there and get kind of in the joints, get in the joints and kind of burn us a little bit. You know. You know, he knows I can't just cut your hand off because you're strong enough, you know. But if you get in there just a little thing like that and we let it stay, then it can really fester. So we got to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. So Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And it's a truth we know that sets us free. Because if we don't know that God has already healed us, then we won't be really free in that area. You know, we're going to be, we'll be messed up. So a carnal mind looks to see something before believing it. And that just means fleshly. That's what carnal means, okay? And Jesus said in Mark 9, 23, he said, You can believe all things are possible to him that believes. He didn't just say some things, a few things. He said, all things are possible. So that means anything that you desire from God is possible. If you believe, right? Yeah. And like Mark 11, 24, what things over you desire when you pray, believe. That's the whole key. When we pray, we have to believe. If we don't believe what we're saying, then we need to shut up. Make sure before we say it out of our mouth in a prayer, do we really believe that God is doing this for us or will do this for us or has done it for us already? Okay? That we've got to make that decision, do I? Because that's where faith is released. You know, when we're, we're saying it as we believe it in our heart, and that devil can't take it away from us. Praise God, you know, he's, he's good. And uh, in John 14, I like this verse, 12 and 15, if you want to look at that, John 14, verses 12 to 15, it's really good. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than me shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you will ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So God gets glory when we ask for things. Isn't that neat? He gets glory when we ask for things. That's in his word. And then this is the best one. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And that's the word. Keep my word. Keep my word. Okay, it's not just, it's not talking about Ten Commands. It says, if you love me, keep my word. What does my word say? Keep it in front of your eyes, right? So it says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do that word. I will do it. It's such a strong uh, Greek word that it means, if I don't physically have it, I will make it and create it for you on the spot. So that is how strong that I will do it means in the Greek. God is saying, I don't have it. I'll just make it for you right there because you're my kid and you deserve the best. You know, that is, that is, is a guarantee that there's nothing he wants to withhold from us. He wants us to have it all.
you know? And that's why we've got to renew our mind. It says in, uh, and, and you know, another thing is, is God is no respecter of persons. The world may be a respecter of people, but God isn't. And it says so in Acts 10, 34, and then Peter opened his mouth, you know, the truth he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. There's a word for it. He doesn't favor somebody over you. He favors us all. He favors those of us that are going for it with the word of God. You know, that's, he, we're all his favorites. He loves all of us. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I bes- Romans 12, 1 and 2, I'll say it again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So what are you doing? You're presenting something. When, you're, when you think of somebody who's a presenter or the master of ceremonies, they're up there and they are showing you something. They're putting something in front of you, right? So he's telling us to present our bodies. In other words, not say, hey, God, take it. We're saying, God, here it is. We're giving it to him. We're not waiting for him to ask for it. We're saying, here I am, Lord. This body, use it for your glory, okay? So you're presenting your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, is a sick body acceptable unto God? No. 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 Not that God doesn't love us when we're sick, but that's not what he considers a uh, presentable, acceptable uh, sacrifice, is it? Let me put it this way. In the Old Testament, you didn't dare bring a sick lamb to be offered as your sacrifice. No. Did you? No. Oh, no. Oh, that was unthinkable. And not only did it have to be a well lamb, but it had to be one without blemish. Because it was a type of Christ, right? But it's also a type of what God wants us to be without blemish. He doesn't want us to have garbage in our bodies or in our mind. He wants us totally free, right? Because we are a billboard for the world. Yes. When they see us, they see Christ, right? Christ in us what? The hope of glory. Okay, so then it says, and be not conformed to this world. And I think about Plato. You get Plato and you stuff it into a can. There's just what happens when you take that can or that mold out? Whatever you stuffed into it is going to have the same mold, right? Like, for instance, you have a uh, uh, one of those kind of like cookie molds to where it's got on each side. Sometimes you make candy that way, and you, you put the candy in one side, you put the mold on top of it, and it gets hard. And when you take the mold off, it's the same shape of what was inside it. Well, he wants to be conformed to who? Yeah. To his image. And I like to as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Jesus is not sick. Jesus is not deformed. Jesus is not poor. Jesus is not captive. That's how he wants us to believe in our mind so that it gets down into our spirit that we don't have to be that way either. And it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how we can totally be transformed, not like a wand, like Cinderella, poof, you know, there you are in your clothes, beautiful dress. No, we are transformed by the word of God, by renewing our mind. That makes us not only different on the inside, but different on the outside. Okay? And it, so we have to, to let that word squeeze us into his image. That why? Because that we may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is totally healed totally free, totally oh, anything that could come against us in this life, being free from that, you know, not in bondage to anything. In Ephesians 4.23, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, we know that our mind affects our spirit if it's not renewed, don't we? Okay, because like for instance, say you go to a church and they don't believe in healing. They believe, well, we don't necessarily believe that it's God's will to heal every time and everyone. Sometimes it's his will for us to, to be this way because he's got a bigger purpose in store that we can give him glory for. I have heard that preached more than once. Not only that, have I heard it preached in a pulpit, I've also heard it preached in movies. Some of them are Christian movies. 
And some of you are loving movies. And that should tell us something. Both things that obviously something's not right, you know. But we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, in the spirit, the Holy, the spirit of the Word. God's Word is life. Spirit, you know, the the Word and the and the Spirit, they're one, right? And so we've got to get this Word in our mind, the way we think. Look at that. Okay, you know, let's turn to First Peter two twenty four. It said, verse 24, 1 Peter 2, 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Okay, so it's saying right there that Jesus bore our sins in his body when he died on the cross, right? And because of him taking our sin, we become the righteousness of God, right? Yeah. But it doesn't leave us just there. It says, by whose stripes you were healed. And it didn't say you were going to be healed. It says you were healed. Yeah. Now, I want to kind of look at something here. <clears throat> In uh, Isaiah 53, 5, it says almost the same thing, it says, except it says, by whose stripes you, were, you are healed. Okay? Because that was before Jesus died. He's saying you are healed. So it was... It was he gave it to you on credit, <clears throat> but when Jesus did it, he says, okay, it's paid for, now you were healed, all right? You were, you are in the Old Testament, but you were in the New, okay? It's a better covenant. Now, it says the word stripes in Isaiah 53, 5 means, the Hebrew word is mapopsi, which it means a full body bruise. That's what that word means, by the stripe. So basically, it's like a singular stripe. Because Jesus was beaten so cruelly that his body was one open wound. You really couldn't tell where one cut started and another one ended. He looked like just one big, open, bloody mess. To be, how, I don't know how else to say it, okay? <laughs> it refers to the terrible lashing that draws blood and produces discoloration and swelling of the entire body. 1 Peter 2.24 reiterates that statement. <clears throat> it is by these same stripes that we were healed. The Greek word that refers to physical healing as it is a word borrowed from the medical terms to describe the physical healing occurring of a human body. Healing of a physical condition. Okay? It's not talking. A lot of people say, well, that's a spiritual healing. No, I'm sorry. It's a physical thing. Jesus did it in the body. And that word actually in that Hebrew and in that Greek is actually saying it's a physical healing. You know, so it's not a spiritual thing. Even though he did die for us in a spiritual sense, it was a, for also a physical healing as well. It wasn't just for our spirit. It wasn't just for our mind. But it was also for our body, okay? So it says, for those who think this reveals to refers only to spiritual healing, this is a real promise of bodily healing that belongs to all who have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's Amen. proof that it is God's will always for us to be healed. Amen. Okay? Amen. And in Matthew 25, 26, this is when Pilate actually was um, scourging Jesus. And that word in the uh, Greek that's for scourging is the word fragello. That's P-H-R-A-G-E-L-L-O. And it's one of the most horrific words used in the ancient world because it brought terrible images to the human mind. Scourging, to them, meant you were first stripped completely naked. Yes, Jesus was naked. And uh, we believe, according to the word of God, he was naked and lost too. He was shamed. Because that's usually what they did to crucifixion victims. He was stripped completely naked and tied to a two-foot whipping post with the hands fastened above the head to a metal ring, and his wrists were securely shackled to that ring to restrain his body from movement. The scourge consisted of a short wooden handle with 18 to 24 inch long straps of leather protruding from it. The ends of those pieces were equipped with sharp pieces of metal, wire, glass, and jagged fragments of bone, and this was considered one of the most feared and deadly weapons of the Roman world. It was so ghastly 
that the mere mention of doing this would stop an individual from continuing disobedience, even the strongest rebel. Most often, two scourgers would be involved. In other words, there would be two people beaten at the same time. They were wicked. And who's the one that put that method of death into their mind? Satan. Obviously, he's wicked. He's, he's evil, you know? And in Isaiah 52, 14, it says, As many were astonished at you, his visage was so marred, more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. He looked hideous. And I'm, I'm really trying to get you, I know this is gross, but I'm really trying to get us all into a, a picture of what Jesus went through for us so we can never say, did he really mean that? Does he really want us well? You know? Because the world says, I don't think he does. So if we meditate on how Jesus' body was scourged so that our body could be healed, consider how valuable you are and your body is to God for him to allow his son to pay such a price. And think of his life's blood being poured out so that you could receive mercy instead of judgment and your debt paid in full. Remember, Jesus was broken so that you could be whole. And I love that. His body was broken so we could be whole. Isn't that wonderful? You know? And uh, he, Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so it says that let us hold fast our profession. Now that word profession means to say the same thing as another, to agree with. Okay, in other words, like if God says it and then we're saying it, we're saying the same thing as what the word says. See what I'm saying? <clears throat> okay. We, whatever subjectively whom we profess to be ours. In other words, we are confessing something over us that's ours, that's mine. Okay, I am healed. I was healed. Okay, that's an open, it also means an open declaration, <clears throat> a public avowal or acknowledgement of one's sentiments or belief. In other words, do you really believe it when you're saying it? And we should be saying what we believe, and we believe the word. And that there that says, um, uh, let's see, that we may obtain mercy. That word obtain means to seize or lay hold of something in order to make it our own, to grab, to capture, or take possession of, or to gently and graciously receive something that is freely and easily given. So basically, it's an action point that we're supposed to be grabbing what God has for us, right? We're supposed to be grabbing mercy. You know, I'm grabbing mercy, especially when I need it. Lord, I'm taking that mercy. I'm seizing it. I'm laying hold of it because it's mine to lay hold of, you know? I love when you read all these little things that it really makes these, these verbs come to life. And, and it says that we may find grace. That word find is the Greek word eurisco, and it means a discovery made by searching or by happenstance. A search by intensive investigation or scientific study or scholarly research. After searching for so long, when one finds it, they scream, Eureka! You ever heard that term? Which means, I found it! It brings intense joy. You know, it's like somebody who's lost a child, and then they find that child. They're screaming, yes! They're back again! My child is not dead, you know? They're so happy, you know? That's how we are with grace. You know, it's something we're going for. We're going in that direction. We're believing it. We're not casting it aside, and we're excited about it. We're, we just can't imagine. We're just rejoicing and thanking God for it. Amen. And then it says to have, find grace to what? To help in time of need. That word help comes from the word that means one is diligently seek it. I have it. I found it. I received it. In other words, help in the time of need phrase, this is interesting, is a military term 
When a soldier gets into trouble, his fellow soldiers are committed to getting him out safely and bringing him back to a place of protection. Think about, you think about the Navy SEALs and the Green Berets. What is it? No man left behind, right? So they're in there, and you may be wounded or whatever, but they're going to get you out at any cost, yeah. even their own, right? I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. And that's what that means, help in time of need. In other words, we have a barrage of angels, and we have his ministering spirits set forth to protect us and to bring us into the, you know, protection, right? Amen. Jesus is committed to giving us what we need, like a mighty warrior willing to fight for us. And I just wanted to go into depth on that because it's, it's really important, you know, that we, we understand what Jesus did for us, yes. you know, and realize this was an intense Crucifixion. This was an intense price that he paid for us. Yes. And that's why we should not hesitate, but we should run to it and grab it and take it all. Amen. And be greedy about it in the spiritual realm. You know what I mean? Not thinking greed in a bad way, but say, I want it all. That's what God wants us to have it all. Don't just say, well, Lord, heal my, heal my uh, uh, arthritis, but don't, I'll, I'll live with a headache. I can take an aspirin for that. No, get rid of the headache too. Don't say, oh, I can handle it. Take it all from God because it's all freely given for us, you know. Don't keep any part of it, you know. We, he wants us to be totally restored and healed. And then uh, we just do a few more scriptures. I have another five minutes. Uh, this one is in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, talking about the mind again. And whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, Amen. lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So if people really knew how good God was, do you think they'd be running from him? No. Do you think they'd be using his name in vain? No. No. But you see, they need to hear. How can they hear without a preacher? What are we preaching to them? You know, what are we telling them? What, are, what is our life telling them when they see us? When we walk into a room, do they know something's different? You know, when we walk into a room, do they realize, man, I'm a sinner, I need to get saved. Not that you're doing or saying anything, but just the anointing that's in you is oozing out of you like sweat does from your body. And that might not be a nice way to say it, but I, I, I want you to see that we should be emanating the life of God in us. And that's, that's what we do when we, when we renew our mind of the Word of God. Amen. And it will, and Satan will be able to blind the eyes Amen. of the world, or blind our eyes. You know, we may be convinced of one thing in the Word of God, but we may not be convinced of something else in the Word of God. God wants us convinced of it all. Because see, if we don't, that means that Satan has blinded our minds to the truth in that area. Amen. You know? Amen. But it says we have the mind of Christ, right? It says, for who is not the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. Jesus said we have it, and we know that Christ means what? Anointed one, right? Okay, so we have the mind of the anointed one. And what does the Bible say? The anointing breaks what? The yoke. Any kind of yoke of bondage, right? You think of somebody that's tied to a, a yoke, and, and they're tied to some place where they can't get free from it. That is not freedom. You know, that is, that's horrible. That's captivity, right? That's not good. But he says, we have that mind of Christ. And what happens when we have the mind of Christ? Philippians 4, 7 tells us. It says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So God's peace, nothing missing, nothing broken, will keep our minds. Like, like we can't understand how great it is, how great God is. But we don't have to. We don't have to understand how electricity works when we turn on that light switch, do we? But we get the benefits of it, right? Yeah. It's the same way with the Word of God. We don't have to know how it works. We don't have to know how faith makes it work. All we have to know is that it does work when we work the Word. You see what I mean? We have, and that we have peace through it. And it says in 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. That sounds like an action thing. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now, when I think about loins, do you remember when in the armor of God? Remember it says, what is it? You're gird up your loins. What's well, not the loins are belted with the belt of what? Truth. Truth. Okay, so when you think about girding up your loins, you're holding up all your clothes with that belt so they, your, or your pants so they don't fall down, okay? And so 
basically, if you don't have the belt of truth on spiritually, you're going to walk around with no pants. Spiritually. Get a, get a picture in your eye. We see a lot of people out there, teenagers, walking around with no pants. Yes. Funny story has nothing to do with this, but I was watching my son play basketball when he was younger, a few years ago. And there were some kids out there with pants that probably that far down where they should have been. And the guy went up and his pants went, <laughs> went down. You never saw a guy who's a teenager so he struggle so quickly to get those pants back up. He needed a belt. He needed pants that had elastic, okay? So this is what happens here. <laughs> yes, this is true. This is true. But I always thought about that. What would happen if that ever happened? And then I got to see it. That was pretty interesting. <laughs> I didn't know the kid, but I did feel sorry for him. And I wonder, I wonder if he would be worried like that anymore, because he didn't pull him up. <laughs> so that's how important the belt is. That's how important the truth is. So you get that picture. That's how important it is to know the truth of the Word of God that says, you've been redeemed from the curse. You've been set free. You are the healed. See? And once we know that, we built it in, then we won't lose it. We'll never lose it. And Satan can't take it from us. And he can't pull them down. You know? I've seen people do that too as a joke. You know, but if you've got something built it on, they can't pull it off. And that's what you need to do in the spirit realm. Get your word belted in with the spirit of truth and know, listen, this is mine. It was paid for. And I'm not losing it. And Satan's not pulling it off me in the name of Jesus. In fact, you're going to kick him out of the way and he can't do it. Praise God. And I'll end with this one scripture and we can do a prayer. And this is one we can all say together. Let's all say this together. James 4, 7. Want to turn to it? Let's turn to it. If you don't know it by heart, let's turn to this and confess this. <clears throat> And then we'll continue next week. James 4. Actually, yeah, yeah, James 4, 7. Everybody got it? Almost have it? Got it? Okay, ready? <clears throat> Let's read together. It says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Let's say it one more time. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So basically, if you are belted in with God and his word, tied to him to where nothing can separate you from his love, okay, then you can say to the devil when he tries to come at you, go in the name of Jesus. And it says he will flee as in terror from you. Because he knows you mean business and he knows you know what the word says. Because he can see that you're on the rock of the truth of God. So we've got to realize that when we're close to God and his word, and his word is in us and our minds renewed, we can, with faith and authority, tell the devil where to go. Amen. You know, sometimes you want to tell people where to go and that's not the right thing to do. Let's vent it at the devil because he's the one we need to be venting it at because he's the one that's making the people do bad things to you. Yeah. You know, we get mad at the wrong person. It's the devil doing it. Yeah. Not that person. Yeah, they're yielding to it, but it's not them because if the devil wasn't even in this world, they would have never thought to do it. Amen. You get it? Amen. You know, we got to realize that. You know, God, God is God and he's good and the devil is bad and we have authority over him. So let's uh, bow our heads, and we're going to dismiss, and if anybody has any needs, we can raise your hand, we can pray afterwards. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your good word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we know who we are in Christ, that we know that all of your promises are yes and amen, and that they're ours for the keeping, Lord, and that you don't withhold any good thing from us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that because of that, we have the power to resist the enemy when he comes at us. And we bind him right now. We rebuke him. We command him to leave us in Jesus' name. And we command restitution from you, Father. In what Satan has stolen from us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that we are given sevenfold back of anything that we have been stolen from. And Lord, we stand in your word. We stand in your promises that we are the healed. 
in our mind, our will, and our emotions, then we are healed in our body as well, Father. And we command our body to line up with your word right now, which says we were healed. And devil, we resist you. We deny you the right to keep symptoms on our body. We command you to go in the mighty name of Jesus. And we call it done by the power of the blood. And we thank you, Father, for it. We have it. We know it. It's ours. And we forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, unless anybody has anything or any needs, we're dismissed.